Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In his Rhetoric Book 2 analysis of the emotions, when he turns to the opposite of anger, prautes in Greek, which we translate as mildness or calmness, one of the things that Aristotle is going to do is look at who we typically feel this towards. And he's going to examine, in some cases, why that's the case. A lot of this, as he points out, can be understood by looking at anger itself and arguing or reasoning from opposites. That is, if people get angry for this reason and you take away that reason, then they're, they're liable to be calm. And so in some cases, calmness is going to be a lack or privation of anger uh, reflected in these different situations and people. In other cases, it's going to be a calming or uh, becoming mild of anger. You start out angry and you become less so, or indeed, perhaps not even not so, not angry by the time that this is done. So there's a number of different classes of people. There's nothing that prevents these, by the way, from overlapping to some degree. And most of these I think we can agree with. There's a few that I'm going to point out where we might say, Aristotle, I don't really know about that. <laughs> Your reasoning doesn't seem to be entirely on point, but uh, we'll get to those in just a bit. So first he talks about people who don't slight, that is they, they don't belittle or insult or show spite to us, or they don't do so voluntarily, right? Things go contrary to their expectation they were trying to make it to our recital, but they got caught in bumper to bumper traffic because of an accident. When we find this out, then we're less angry at them for missing the event, right? Or they tried their best to make a wonderful cake for somebody's birthday, but they misread the list of ingredients and they put in far too much salt. <laughs> Like they didn't understand the difference between teaspoons and tablespoons in recipes. And it comes out and you're like, oh, this is terrible, right? And then they're like, oh, well, I tried my best. Okay, so then you don't get uh, angry with them. And Aristotle throws in something very important here. He's got this little uh, quip where he's like, or um, it doesn't appear to be so, right? Phenomenois, uh, right? So, why throw that in? Because anger is, in many respects, um, a matter of our assumptions, our perspe perceptions, our imaginations. So, if somebody does slight us, but we don't think that they are, then we're not going to get angry at them. Or maybe it really was intended maliciously, but they tell us that it wasn't and that they didn't do so voluntarily. And we're like, oh, okay, I'll, I'll let it slide. And then later on we find out, well, then we could become angry again. He also says something really interesting here. And I, I think that this one is perhaps one that we have to question a bit. Those who act the same or do the same things as oneself. Uh, the translation here of Fries is all who behave in the same way to themselves. And Aristotle's reasoning there is that we're not likely to slight ourselves. We're not likely to insult ourselves, spite ourselves, um, show contempt towards ourselves. Uh, that could be a bit questionable, but let's, let's just assume that for the moment. So when other people behave the same way to us, then 
we are calm, not angry towards them. Is this really borne out in experience? I do not think so. Not in ancient Greece and not in our own time. If, however, we get the person to realize that it's ridiculous or silly or irrational for them to be angry at somebody else for doing exactly the same things or similar things to what we do, then I think that's what Aristotle is talking about here. So it's not just that people who do the same thing as us and we're sort of in a uh, knee-jerk reaction to them that we don't get angry with them. We, we probably do, but we can apply this cognitive remedy to calm people. What happens when somebody does do things like you know, insulting or sliding um, and we get angry? Well, we become calm, and he says, those who admit homologous, this means to agree, right, literally, but it would mean to admit that you did something wrong. So I say, I didn't like that, and then you say, oh, you're right, I shouldn't have done that, that was wrong, and it goes a little bit further. Those who, we translate this as those who are sorry, if we wanted an older-fashioned way of translating this, it would be those who repent of, those who are uh, bothered by, saddened by, pained by the fact that they did the wrong thing. The Greek for this is meta melomenois. And that meta it plays a very important role. There's a lot of meta in the language of remorse and repentance in ancient moral philosophy, not just in Aristotle, but also in the Stoics and also in uh, later Christian writers. Um, so metanoia, changing one's mind, but not changing it like, oh, I'll have pizza instead of tacos. It's more like, Ooh, I really need to get my crap together because I'm a bad person. I need to change my perspective. So those who did wrong and admit it and are repenting or sorry for it in some way. Also, similarly, those who humble themselves, tape numenois, and who do not contradict, right? When one of the tendencies when somebody angers us and we tell them about that is for them to say, oh, you're wrong. You shouldn't be angry. I didn't, I didn't mean to do it. Those are ways of contradicting us. It wasn't that bad. What are, you, what are you so upset about? Quit being such a sensitive snowflake, right? Well, uh, if you want people to be calmer, don't contradict them. <laughs> Especially don't tell them to calm down because all of those are ways of showing contempt, slighting. So you're actually making the anger worse by doing that sort of thing. By contrast, those who do humble themselves and who don't contradict can lessen the amount of anger. And he he has an explanation here. They seem to recognize they are inferior. Those who are inferior are afraid. No one who is afraid slights another. It's kind of an implausible reconstruction on Aristotle's part. But we could say that by humbling yourself, you are in fact placing yourself in a lower position with the other person. You're not lording it over them as you might be doing if you're contradicting them. Uh, another one that uh, he brings up is those who are serious with those who are taking something seriously or those who are being serious. Spudaios. Spudaios can mean a good person. It can also mean somebody who is taking something seriously. So if, um, you know, even if it's something that doesn't need to be taken seriously, like, you know, you check engine light comes on, which these days in, in our cars could mean basically anything, if they're like, oh, this is bad, and, and you're like, oh, no, don't worry about it. It's not a big deal. You, you can make them angry. On the other hand, if you're like, oh, yeah, what do we need to do to get this fixed? Can I give you, can I follow you to the, to the uh, repair shop, and we'll have them take a look at it? Now you're actually treating them as if the things that they're concerned with are serious, and that will help to calm them. That will help to not convey insult or anything like that. Another one, those who refrain from, who do not engage in 
insult, hubris, right, which is one of the forms, one of the main forms of sliding. Um, that's that's quite important. Or mockery, right? Heliastis, um, uh, or uh, sliding. You don't want to be again putting yourself above somebody else and insulting them or mocking them or showing contempt for them. And now Aristotle says something really interesting with this. He says towards three kinds of people. He doesn't use the word three there, but there's a listing that's going on. Uh, either towards nobody, they don't do this to anybody, right? They don't insult or mock or slight anybody. Or they don't mock those who are helpful, who are useful, Christus, who are good people. Or one doesn't do this to those who are one considers to be like oneself. There's something about seeing somebody who we identify with or view as similar to ourselves getting mocked, getting ridiculed, getting insulted, getting treated badly that tends to get us angry at the person who's doing it. You could say on their behalf, but also on our own behalf. Now, here we get to one where I think this is pretty implausible, except for really good people. Aristotle says that, um, well, actually before that, let's talk about fear and respect. This, this is a little bit more plausible. It says, people are mild towards those who they fear, they feel phobos, fear towards, or uh, respect, literally a sense of shame in relation to. Uh, why? Um, because it's impossible to be afraid and angry at the same time. And presumably by extension, it's impossible to feel respect towards somebody and be angry at them at the same time. And he also says those who show respect to us, we don't uh, get angry at them. Uh, the, the feeling fear, sometimes fear turns into anger, right? If, uh, for example, students are afraid that their grade is going to be bad uh, and they don't quite understand what's going on, sometimes they lash out at teachers, right? They get angry at the two. Why, why are you doing this? I'm going to report you to the dean. I'm going to give you a bad review or things like that. And similarly, when, when we respect people, if they treat us in a way that we don't like, we might think that we're really on their level and get angry. But, you know, for the most part, this is right. What about this next one? Those who have acted, literally, those who have done things in anger. We don't get angry at them. Why not? So the argument that Aristotle gives here seems to be a little bit implausible. He says, those who feel anger do not seem to have acted from a desire to slight other people. Ugardi oligurian phainontai praxai. Why? Because nobody slights another when anger, since slight is free from pain, but anger is accompanied by it. Not a very good argument there. Um, it's quite possible that when we are angry, if we examine our own experiences, that we do engage in things that are forms of slighting. We treat others with contempt. We look down on them because we're angry at them. We engage in hubris or insult, right, which makes us feel a little bit better. And we tell ourselves that we're setting things straight, but oftentimes we go too far with it. Or sometimes we're just malicious and spiteful. I'll show you, you son of a bitch, right? And that is a form of slighting as well. So people who are angry, especially if they have anger problems, if they're vicious with respect to anger, as Aristotle would say, they often do engage in slighting, not only against the people they're angry with, but perhaps even against other people as well. So this, this idea that those who have acted in anger, we don't get angry with them, doesn't really hold up, except if we say, if we ourselves understand human psychology, and we realize that people are acting in anger, we can say, oh, you poor bastard, uh, I feel 
pity for you or compassion for you because you're doing these stupid things. Anger does tend to make us stupid. Aristotle in Nicomachean Ethics Book 7 says anger is like a hasty servant. It hears part of what's being said and then rushes off to fulfill the orders that it didn't quite get right. And so anger is like that. So we could, in fact, feel compassion towards those who are uh, angry or mild towards them, but it's it's probably not the case universally. Um, This is another one that's very interesting. When they think that they themselves did wrong or committed injustice, adikain, right? The word for to, to do injustice. When they think that they did wrong, and have rightly suffered. Dikaios, which is the opposite of adike. Dikaios is an, is an adverb, right? Justly. Uh, Paschen is to suffer. So when you do something to somebody else, and you realize that it's wrong, and you're like, well, I did in fact deserve what uh, somebody else meted out to me, what punishment, what retribution, what revenge they took, um, then you, you remain mild. But a lot of people do, in fact, do the wrong thing, suffer rightly, but don't realize that that's the case. They think that they did the right thing, or at least not the wrong thing, and that they suffered unjustly, and they're going to be still angry. So a lot uh, is depending on this think or uh, deem or judge in this case. And then finally, when the retribution won't be known as coming from oneself. This is a very interesting observation on Aristotle's part here. Um, And I think that there's probably something to this. He actually talks about this with a a few examples. He says, people are milder if they think that those who are being punished or who retribution is being imposed upon um, will never know that the punishment comes from them in requital for their own wrong. And the, the word that he uses here is not actually timorasis, the uh, you know, revenge or retribution. It is actually the word for, for punishing, um, there's kind of some overlap here. And he says, um, anger has to do with the individual, uh, as is clear from our definition. Wherefore, it is justly said by the poet, this is Homer, if you don't remember the famous uh, story of Odysseus and his men who are stuck in the Cyclops, Polymephus's cave being eaten one by one and they wait till he falls asleep after they get him drunk and then they gouge out his eye and they manage to escape. Odysseus cannot resist saying something to Polyphemus. Tell him that it is Odysseus, sacker of cities. And Aristotle interprets this as saying as if Polyphemus would not have been punished if he'd remained ignorant of who had blinded him and for what. So Aristotle goes on and he says, people are not angry either with those who cannot know who punishes them or with the dead because they've paid the last penalty and can neither feel pain nor anything else, which is the aim of those who are angry. And then he has to bring up another example from Homer, that of Achilles, who is angry at Hector, angry against a dead man, and um, uh, you know, the, the, the line is, it is senseless clay, he outrages in his wrath. What is, what is uh, Achilles doing? Well, he's taking the dead body and dragging it behind his chariot and riding around to tear it up because Hector, who's now dead, killed by Achilles, killed Patroclus, Achilles' lover, when Achilles was sulking out of anger in his tent. Now, This is a very interesting dynamic. Is Aristotle right about this? Uh, There's good reason to think that he probably is as a generalization. I mean, some people are cool with um, taking revenge no matter how it it works, whether the other person knows it or not. Passive-aggressive actions are like that. But in a lot of cases, knowing that the other person is not going to realize that you're the one who is responsible for punishment, could make you feel less angry, more mild towards them, more 
calm. So these are a number of important considerations. If we want to understand this emotion of calmness or mildness, that is the opposite of anger, we need to know with whom people typically feel this and why they feel this emotion.